Hey everyone, we're back with our last River Valley Civilization. Today we're going to be talking about the Shang Dynasty and the Zhou Dynasty and the civilizations that developed along the Yellow River, also called the Huanghe River and the Yangtze River. So as usual, you've got your key concepts. Take a minute, pause, reflect, think about life. And we're moving on. Talking about geography, China is divided into two major geographical regions. You've got the steppe and the desert, which made communication a bit difficult unless you were familiar with how to navigate through this area. And later on, as we begin talking about the Silk Road, luckily, there was a group of people who are familiar with the steppe area, and they're called the Scythians. And they're going to help make this, this trading route possible. The eastern zone is very suitable for agriculture. In the north, you have wheat and millet, and in the south, you have rice. Now, the cool thing about rice is that it yields more crop per acre than any other type of grain, and that's going to allow the population in southern China to develop very quickly. In addition, there were also resources of timber, stone, and metals. Um, the Shang were able to make copper, but they also made beautiful bronze vessels and tools. Now, China is also known, and soon and into this podcast, they're going to become very well known for two beautiful luxury goods. And the first was silk, developed around 4500 BCE. And then jade decorations emerge about 1500 years later in 3000 BCE. And by 2500 BCE, probably in part because of these luxury goods, the first early urban centers begin emerging. Now, pre Shang China was a land of smaller Neolithic communities, perhaps a few city states, and we know that pigs, chicken, and millet were domesticated. Now, what we what we don't know is who ruled China before the Shang, and there is a legendary dynasty called the Shia, but there's no con contemporary documents. We can't say with one hundred percent certainty that they ever actually existed. But in all likelihood, they probably did. Was there a massive dynasty the size of the Shang or the Han? Probably not. Did they rule a city-state? That, that can probably be said. But again, we don't know for sure. And since this is history, we like to be sure. All right, so let's dive into the Shang, shall we? Early Chinese writing began in the Shang dynasty, Unfortunately, we don't have a specific date, uh, but we do know the first identifiably Chinese writing dates back to 1200 BCE. And the writing has all been found on what historians call oracle bones, because the Shang rulers used them to predict the future. And Shang religion focused on a supreme god, but the supreme god could not be directly approached by anyone. However, he could be reached through indirect means through the ruler's ancestors. So the ruler is serving as a middleman. And this link between heaven and the earth, the gods and the people, provides a great reason to, to really follow that authoritarian rule. Because the emperor can communicate with the gods. And you really don't want to mess that up. And the Shang elite were a warrior aristocracy. They enjoyed hunting. Um, the Shang had a great military. Their weapons were ma usually made of bronze, and they also rode on horse-drawn chariots. And a big part of how we know this is, again, from those oracle bones, over 200,000 so far have been um, excavated in China. And speaking of bronze, by the way, check that out. Guys, look at these artifacts that the Shang were able to create. These bronze vessels, the wine jars, the goblet and pitchers. And let's not forget that incredibly scary looking dagger. Uh, ceremonial dagger, I'm going to be real with you guys. It was probably used for sacrifice. And here's the thing about the Shang that we're going to get into is that they did sacrifice people. 
but you do what you got to do, right? Uh, Shang Dynasty with other people. Um, what we know about the Shang, we have learned from Sima Qian. And he was a Chinese historian who was able to assemble all of this information. And he's one of the first historians. Uh, he, he's often referred to as the Chinese Herodotus. He is the actual first historian in Greece. And what we know about the Shang is kings ruled directly over their kingdom and they exercised indirect rule over areas that were further out. And again, they engaged in warfare. They were very good at it. And when they won, they would capture the losers. And some of them were used as slaves, but others were killed as sacrifices they were offering to the gods. And the kings were buried in these massive tombs. And here's a picture of one of them. And how that works is when the kings were buried, they were also buried with hundreds of sacrificial offerings. And yeah, th this could be animals. This could be favorite pets. Um, this could be lesser family members, perhaps the wives of the king. Um, children who are never going to take the throne servants of course and slaves because the belief was in the afterlife you need this companionship you need this company and kings were also buried in order according to social class so all these corpses that are in the royal tombs with the kings there's there's an order that they're buried in because even in the afterlife social class is very important and we do know that there were other people in China during the Shang rule, but only the Shang left behind written records. All right, so we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the Zhou period. And the Zhou dynasty was a dependent state of the Shang. And then they went to war and ended up overthrowing the Shang in 1045 BCE. And again, we know this because of Sima Qian. And this is where the Mandate of Heaven actually comes from. So there's two founders of the Zhou, uh, Wen and his son Wu. And Wu um, attacks the Shang capital and he assumes the throne as the first of the dynasty. And the Zhou have a different god. And they also introduce the concept of the Mandate of Heaven. And the Mandate of Heaven centers on the belief in a god and heaven and heaven chooses which dynasty would rule china and as long as the rulers are doing a good job and good things are happening the food is abundant people are happy then that ruler gets to stay the ruler but when things start going wrong there's a drought there's an earthquake uh there's invasions there's unrest that's a sign that the rulers have lost the approval of the gods. Hence, they have lost the mandate of heaven and the right to rule. And the Zhou were incredibly intelligent because they came up with this in order to justify the fact that they overthrew the Shang. And this, the mandate of heaven is going to be used throughout different dynasties in history within China. Now, the Zhou is divided into two smaller periods. The Western Zhou, things were going great. 1045 to 771 BCE. And the Eastern Zhou, things aren't going so good. Um, the Eastern Zhou is characterized by a massive decline in the power of the central government. And you'll all, the, the capital will also be moved. And the Eastern Zhou is divided into two periods as well. Um, you've got the spring and autumn period, and you've got the warring states period. And the spring and autumn period is not as, as chaotic as the warring states period. And this is the last part of the Zhou dynasty. It's 41 to 221 BC. It's a very, very slow decline. And you have massive intensity of warfare between the states and pretty much the uh the warring states period the last part of the Zhou. you've got different factions breaking off and the Zhou are pretty much only rolling in name there's incredible amounts of bloodshed and fighting 
And beginning of the third century BCE, only seven major states remained, and each were seeking security by building these massive walls and creating large armies. And they're trying out different examples of military tactics and technology, which is actually a, a good thing for, for the rest of the world, because they're going to benefit from that once trade opens up. But right now, this is not good for anyone living in China. And the most innovative of all the states was the Qin. And they're on the western edge of all the states. And its location made it very vulnerable to attacks by what, by who were referred to as the barbarians. And if you're a barbarian in 300 BCE, it pretty much means you're wearing pants. Because you're riding a horse a lot. You're a nomad, essentially. The Mongols, probably one of the most intimidating and skilled people with military technology were called barbarians because guess what? They wore pants. They rode on horses. But the Qin were attacked by different barbarians and they were able to fight it off. And word spread, hey, the Qin were able to secure their area. I wonder what they'll do next. Well, the logical thing, they're going to start taking over. And in the middle of the 4th century BCE, Lord Shang, who is the leader of the Qin government, helped develop the legalist school of political theory. And legalists were willing to sacrifice personal freedom for the state. And the whole point of, of the legalist school of thought is people are inherently evil by nature. They can't help it. It's just who they are. And without law, order, justice military people will run amok it'll be anarchy and we'll all die and it's it's kind of a sad gloomy outlook on life but if you remember from your american studies if you know who thomas hobbes is thomas hobbes said the same thing people are inherently evil by nature and without laws they'll do whatever they want all right so moving along the joe period technological advances in warfare came the Zhou from the northern steppes. So you learn how to fight on horseback. And they also replaced bronze with iron and steel. And in addition, all of this warfare created a frequency in using foot soldiers. And also men who were of non-noble families were promoted in the military. So prior to this, um, this warring states period, in the Zhou, only nobles were promoted. Only nobles were made officers. But... Now the common man who proves that he can fight on a horse can be promoted. And while this may seem progressive, we also have to keep in mind that people probably kept dying and they were running out of nobles. And while uh, the advances in the military are happening, let's not forget, advances in the government. You have a new class of educated men who are becoming bureaucrats. Again, a lot of people are dying, folks. And they're also recording data for the rulers. They're administering the government's business. They're offering advice. And in the meantime, of course, religion is still playing a very important role. Women, regardless of class, were expected to live a life of subservience to their husbands. Um, women were meant to stay indoors. Uh, most, most homes in China had what was called the woman's room. And this is where women would go during the day to do household chores. And here's a lovely chart, the Mandate of Heaven. So after several generations, the new dynasty is aging. They neglect their duties. Things are corrupt. They lose control of the provinces. Heavy taxes. Guys, taxes, any time an empire is going to collapse, look for the taxes. Allows um, defensive walls to decay. First of all, when the walls go up, that's a problem. You know that's another sign that the empire is going to poo-poo out when the walls are put up. And then when the walls start decaying, that's even worse. All right, let's talk religion for a few minutes. Confucianism and Taoism. So Confucius was born in... 551 BCE. And the only record that we have of Confucius is found in the Analects. And it's a record of discussions, conversations, um, quotes that he may uh that he said. And 
Confucianism is very different than legalism because Confucianism assumes that human nature is essentially good. And there's also a certain view of the universe, society, family, everything has a hierarchy. And there's five key relationships that go with Confucianism. And you have, you have to maintain these relationships in order to maintain society. And they also establish the moral foundations of government, again, the Analects. Confucianism doesn't discuss the afterlife or the supernatural, though, and as a result, it's more often viewed as, as a philosophy than a religion. It, um, Taoism, however, Taoism is a very go with the flow, and the earliest Taoist texts date back from 300 BCE. And Taoist and Confucian texts are found side by side, and that reveals that they were not perceived as a competing belief system. Taoists believe that the way includes learning to meditate and to control one's breathing and life force. And what we know about the Tao, it's very connected with nature. There's no absolute moral standards and people should really just take the world as they find it. All right, so just a quick review, pastoral nomads of the Eurasian steppes. 1000 to 100 BCE, um, we know they didn't settle in one place. They moved from one place to the other. They were probably either nomadic hunter-gatherers, but we do know later they would become herders. And for most of human history, there's always been hunter-gatherers. There are still hunter-gatherers today, um, but these people will be found um, in Western Asia, and they'll also later be living in Mongolia. Um, the steppe nomads, oh no. Okay, there we go. That's fine. Um, steppe nomads could do anything on horseback. They were warriors, they were herders. Um, the steppe nomads in particular lived in what's modern day Hungary to southern Siberia. And nomads didn't possess any riding technology. So all we know about them, we know from somebody else who was not a nomad. And again, you're wearing pants that makes you a barbarian. So everything we do know about these people comes with some kind of bias. The Scythians. Um, these were people, and again, the Greek historian Herodotus describes them as a warlike people. Well, that's great. Um, living to the north of the Black and Caspian Seas. And there were, again, no permanent settlement, driving livestock, and... Because uh, they're very mobile, they need again. They need to be to be able to do anything on horseback. So their military capabilities are incredible. They were able to resist invasion by very large empires, and Persia is a great example. Um, empires found it a little difficult to control these people because the borders were very fluid. But again, what you have to remember is everything we know about these people, we're getting it from the people that were either afraid of them, that didn't like them, or that perhaps lost to them. Now, the Scythians are never going to invade Persia, but they are able to keep Persia away from them. That's a very important distinction. All right. So uh, the Shangni nomads, we're going to talk about them quite a bit later, especially when we move into the Han. Um, they're a group of nomads that actually will form, um, they'll come together and they'll create the Shangnu Confederacy. And they are going to be um, a struggle for every single dynasty because they're um, coming in, they're invading, they're very skilled um military fighters on horseback if you don't have a horse they can run you down it's, it's kind of intimidating so some dynasties we'll see are are buying them off with gifts have some food have some silk here marry my daughter um other dynasties will actually fight them off all right so leave with some food for thought analyze the changes and continuities in chinese civilization from 2000 to 231 bce and compare the early civilizations that emerged in the Americas to the cultures that emerged in the Eurasian steppes. And we'll actually be talking about the Americas later this week. Have a great night, guys. Cheers.